Johnny said, well, listen, Robert wants to modify some of his cars in an eco-friendly way. Would this guy talk to him? So Jay goes, yeah, and not knowing that I knew Robert. So he connects me and Johnny. Johnny and I get in the phone, and we start talking, and he says, you know, Robert wants to modify his cars. He's got this charity, and he really cares about the environment. Can you help him? And I said, yeah. I said, I can absolutely help him. I said, by the way, I know him. He's like, you know him? I said, yeah, I've been friends with his dad for 20-something years, and I've met Robert over the years. He's like, this is crazy. Yeah, it goes from so Porsches, you know, to, to other oddball stuff, you know, um, very, very different days. And even like we were talking about building out some of, you know, this stuff, because some of the cars he wanted us to find for him, you know, like he was really into El Caminos, you know, and a lot of times, like how many Porsche guys are into El Caminos, those, you know, or even Porsche guys are into vets. You know, I think I talked about this the other day with some friends about these auto shows and how important they are uh, for the manufacturer to be here to, to get little kids interested in these cars, you know, because I know for myself, you know, I've been coming to these shows for years. I, you know, as a young kid, I would see these Corvettes, and I was like, man, I'm going to have one of those one of these days. I'm going I'm to have that car. And that love affair started 40, 50 years ago at these shows, you know. So it's important that we get the younger generation, you know, into the cars and actually into the hobby and, and as a job. Hey, this is Chris Mazzilli, and this is Cars and Culture with Jason Stein. We've never had somebody broadcasting from the floor of an auto show, but it couldn't be more appropriate to have Chris <laughs> joining us from the floor of the New York Auto Show as it effectively opens. Uh, we were just there and saw many show guests that we've had on the program. Now we have a new one to add to the roster. Chris, what car are you sitting in? And thank you for being with us. Ah, thanks for having me. Uh, honored to do it, and I'm sitting in a beautiful 1966 Buick Riviera that you restored. I'm assuming that's correct. We did, yeah, yeah. It's uh, one of Robert Downey Jr.'s cars, and we uh, modified it in an eco-friendly way. Yes, of course. We have a whole story around that that we're going to get to. But uh, how special for you to be able to show this to the world at the show now? Uh, at the New York Auto Show, which is 124 years old this year, by the way, the, the uh, New York show. And you're part of history here. He's part yeah. of it. It's a fantastic show. Actually, I, I love the New York Auto Show. I've been coming since I'm a little kid, you know, back when it used to be at the Coliseum. Uh, so, you know, very, very excited to be here. And like, you know, I'm, I'm a car guy. So I just, I love talking about cars, being a part of the culture. And uh, to have something here that we did in our shop is it's ultra special, especially for, you know, a guy like Downey. Before we get into his, his story, uh, how much time was put into this vehicle that you're sitting in? Well, we had to do six cars in 18 months. Uh, normally a build like this would be a year and a half, two years, give or take. Um, so we farmed some out. So we probably had about 1800 hours into this car, give or take. That's 1800 hours correct <laughs> is that a, is that average is is that more is that less What's the you know it's kind of it's kind of old there is no average anymore i mean we've yeah. done four thousand hours we've done a thousand it, it kind of depends on how it all comes together um and some builds are more difficult than others and the other thing too is you know there were a lot robert was involved in every aspect of the design of this particular car so we went back and forth on different things tried different colors a lot of spray out so that added to the time, but in the end, it's, you know, it's turned out to be what he wanted. And every car has its own story, of course. Yes. So what's the story of this one? Roberts always loved these older Buick ribs and wanted one. So before we even started, you know, the, the talk of the show, he had wanted me to find him one. So we found one. It just kind of coincided with the TV show. Uh, we looked around and found a pretty original 66 car. It was originally burgundy with a black gut uh nice straight car it needed body work it was dinged up here and there but a, a very solid car and a good car to start with uh, and he just loved it you know, like one of the things we talked about is if you look at this car um and obviously i'm looking at the dash right now for 1966 it was very futuristic looking very very modern looking it does not look like a 60 year old car yeah it's amazing so, to think of that uh the cars of that era and and you just 
you just hit hit the nail on the head there. These vehicles are now 60 years old. So when you think of restorations, I mean, there's a lot that goes into that. But you tell me. Yeah, you know what? There is a ton. And we were building these cars during COVID. So there were supply chain issues. We couldn't get stuff. I mean, stuff that we'd normally get in two or three days took months. You know, so you think about a build and being held up you know, waiting on, and there wasn't just one, it was multiple parts. Uh, and even there were times like, you know, somebody in, in our shop would get COVID and we shut down for 10 days or eight days, you know, because early on we didn't know what COVID exactly was. So, you know, we, we, the regulations kind of changed a lot, but there were times when we couldn't even open the shop during, you know, production. Uh, so it was, it was, it was definitely challenging. And you, you referenced his involvement with the vehicle. And I would say when it, when it comes to what he wants to change on a, on a somewhat regular basis, what is he looking for? What, where does he want to add his own stamp? Well, I, I think it was kind of twofold. So number one, everything had to be modified in an eco-friendly way. And any way we can make something sustainable or more eco-friendly, we did that. Um, sometimes it didn't make sense. Like the interior in this Riviera I'm sitting in is beautiful. It's not ripped. So why get rid of this, you know, and make more garbage if you don't have to? Uh, and it just, it kind of works. I mean, we did some cool wood inlays, but outside of that, we really didn't do a lot to the interior of the car. Um, you know, there was other cars where we did like the, the 65 Corvette has mushroom leather interior. The Mercedes has, you know, the, the interior and the carpet is from recycled plastic bottles. Um, you know, so we, a lot of neat stuff. The, the El Camino has vegan leather interior. Um, the El Camino has electric bikes that are powered by a solar panel on the roof of the car. And then the other part of it was the design. So his, you know, he tends to like matte finishes. So all these cars are finished in matte, uh, four painted two are wrapped, very unique colors. Like, you know, the car I'm sitting in right now is kind of like an orangey peachy type of color, not something I've seen before on anything on, you know, on the road. And people kind of, you know, it's like, it's one of those things people either love or they hate it, you know. What they do appreciate is the build of the car and the lines of the car. Matter of fact, I have a, a good friend of mine working here with me today. And uh, he was like, you know, I got to tell you, out of all these cars, if I could have one, I, I would take the Riviera. He goes, I just love the way it looks. I love the comfort inside. He goes, that'd be the car for me. Yeah, amazing. And you're in a perfect spot for the world to see and and comment and talk about it. And you're also... Uh, in Manhattan, and you're a guy from Long Island. Uh, you That's are, uh, by you, some of the monikers that I've seen, you're the king of cars, the maestro of motor ability, the captain of Corvettes <laughs> in New York. <laughs> tell tell us a little bit about how you got here. I, I know we're going to get to the Robert Downey Jr. story, but, or actually, yeah, we'll yeah. Robert Downey Sr. in a minute, but tell me how you got yeah. here. So I've been a car guy my whole life. My father actually, as a teenager, worked for a few Chevrolet dealerships in Queens, New York. At uh, 18 years old, he ordered a brand new, it, originally he ordered a 57 Chevy Bel Air convertible with uh, a 283 with 270 horsepower, dual quads, but he couldn't get it. They stopped making them. So his boss said to him, you know, Angelo, um, we're coming out with this new car called uh, an Impala. It's new for 1958. So he wound up ordering a 1958 Bel Air 348 Tri Power, three speed on the column with a 355 Posi. And 58 was the first full year that you could get Posi. Uh, so a lot of cars back in the day didn't, didn't have Posi. So he, it was an animal. I mean, he, he beat everything. The only thing he, Tommy lost was to a vet and to a 58 Bonneville, which was a sister car from Pontiac with a supercharger on it. Other than that, he smoked <laughs> everything. So, and by the way, the guy's girlfriend was driving the car, the Pontiac, but she had to <laughs> make, make that point. But he, uh, my dad, who still was today, God bless him. He loves cars. I got hooked at a very young age. And by like four or five years old, I could name every car on the road. And I was just hooked. And, it, you know, in particular, Chevrolet back then. Um, and then it kind of you know, move to other stuff. But I just, I, I, it started my love early on. I started going to car shows. I would tinker with my father and work on the cars. And that started the love affair with cars for me. And, and I've, then I've kind we, of been... Yeah, go ahead. I was saying, I, I've kind of been hooked ever since. I mean, I started building model cars when I was younger. And then, you know, 16, 17, I started buying cars and flipping them. Um, I would get a car that looked beat up and 
and dirty and clean it up and you know make five six seven hundred bucks or a thousand dollars uh and it just kind of furthered my interest in it this was your calling clearly it i love it i could talk about it 24 7 i, I i'm totally obsessed with it and it's never ever wavered ever wow it's a great story about 20 years ago uh you're you're a film producer or, or you were at least hired to produce a film for robert downey senior the movie never got made but yes. something else resulted. So tell, walk me through that. Tell the audience about how, me, how there's mentorship in there and how yeah. sometimes some things that don't work out really work out. So true. So, yes, I met Senior over 20 years ago through a mutual friend. He was looking to produce a movie. He knew I had contacts within the industry. Uh, it was a cool little film. You know, um, Steve Buscemi was attached to be in it. And then Robert Sr. got hired to direct uh, a documentary for a lot of money, and he left to go do that. But we stayed friends, and we would have lunch once a month, once every two months, and talk about life. And he kind of talked to me about business and old Hollywood and how, you know, Eli Kazan taught him. And there was another guy uh, who worked with Bob in a lot of feature films and also did a lot of films for Sidney Lumet named Bert Harris. Uh, and I learned so much from these guys about life, about the movie business, about Hollywood. It was just, it was awesome. But of course, Junior's name would come up a lot. And then I met Junior at a couple of family functions. So that kind of started the relationship with the Downey family. And because of the relationship, that led to Robert Downey Jr. Correct. And how do we get into the process of, well, I know there's a Bronco involved, but you tell the story. Yeah, yeah, it, it's kind of there's always so... A Chris, that, 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 but that's how it all started. Right. So, um, a good friend of mine was an agent at CAA named Scotty Locker. He now runs Jimmy Kimmel's company, but Scotty Locker was an agent at CAA. He represented, represented a guy named Jay Peterson who owns a company called Matador content. Jay was a car guy. So Scott, I had some different car show ideas. So he's like, you know what? You need to meet Jay Peterson. He's a great guy. You guys will hit it off. He likes cars, you know, and he's got this great production company. He's a player in the business. Go meet this guy. So Jay and I meet, and I love the guy from day one. He's a great guy, smart, knowledgeable, you know, great company. Um, and we just hit it off. And we built, uh, initially, he wanted us to build a 68 Camaro for him. Uh, we wind up doing a series together with Michelle Rodriguez called Riding Shotgun. With Michelle Rodriguez, I was a co-host on that show. Um, it was made for Yahoo, Yahoo. Um, and then uh, we built this crazy 73 Ford Bronco for Jay, which plays into the story. Three and a half years ago, he was driving this out in the Hamptons, and he ran to a friend of his named John Shuloff. John Shuloff is one of Robert's business partners. And um, Johnny saw the, the Bronco and said, oh, my God, I love this thing. Who built it? Jay said, Chris Mazzilli, my car spirit guy, you know, you got you to gotta meet this guy. And Robert said, and Johnny said, well, listen, Robert wants to modify some of his cars in an eco-friendly way. Would this guy talk to him? So Jay goes, yeah, and not knowing that I knew Robert. So he connects me and Johnny. Johnny and I get in the phone, and we start talking, and he says, you know, Robert wants to modify these cars. He's got this charity, and you know, he really cares about the environment. Can you help him? And I said, yeah. I said, I can absolutely help him. I said, by the way, I know him. He's like, you know him? I said, yeah, I've been friends with his dad for 20-something years. And I've met Robert over the years. He's like, this is crazy. So Robert and I get in the phone and he's like, Mazzilli, he's like, I, I, he goes, I thought you were only in, you know, the comedy business. He's like, I didn't even know anything about this. This is crazy. You know, so that's how the whole thing kind of came together. And he said, initially, I said, Robert, what do you want to do with these cars? And he goes, I want you to help me modify them in an eco-friendly way. And then I want to sell them and use the proceeds to fund my charity. And I said, okay. I said, listen, I could definitely help you. I said, but uh, I just did uh, a sweepstakes, a 36 Corvettes that we did for History Channel. I said, and that's a, I think you could raise more money that way and more awareness for the charity. As a, and as a matter of fact, if we really want to blow the thing up, we should do a TV series based on the build of these cars. And he was like, oh, that's a great idea. So me, Robert, John Shuloff, and Jay Peterson got together in the Hamptons three or so years ago. Uh, and Jay and I pitched Robert and Johnny the idea of the TV show. And Robert said, I get it. 
I love it. Let's do it. Me and Mazzilli will co-host it, and the four of us will exec produce it. So that's how this whole thing came together. Um, but it was 20 years in the making. No kidding. 20 years in a family relationship and yep. uh, not the awareness that you were doing things like this. And up until that point, what what was your level of restoration prior to prior to this taking off? So I, I, I've been involved in a shop for about 10 years um, and primarily, you know, we do stock restorations for Corvettes, muscle cars and classics. And now we do a lot of resto mods and, you know, and, and by default, resto mods, a lot of times are environmentally friendly because you're putting in a modern motor. Most of these modern motors get two and a half times the gas mileage and two and a half times the horsepower than, you know, their original equivalent. So just by default, we we're already doing that type of stuff. But, you know, we've got a great group of guys in, in the shop. You know, they're very, very knowledgeable. They're great fabricators, you know, really think things through. So we were already doing cool builds to begin with. Um, and really, if you look at it, kind of that Bronco started this whole thing, you know, and it's a, it, it's, it was a, just a beautiful build. I love it. And Jay's got really good taste, you know, in, in building cars. He's the type of guy that he was very involved in the design of his vehicles. So, you know, a cool vehicle really started the whole thing. What a dream to be involved with Robert at this level, uh, obviously. And um, a, a little bit of a pinch me moment, right, Chris? It's crazy. It, it really is. And he's he's a he's a great guy. He's a total sweetheart. You know, working with him, he knew everybody's name on the set. You know, really just a gracious guy. I mean, and, and to be quite frank, much more involved in the show than I think anybody expected him to be. Just from the and, and also not only the show, but involved with working with every aspect of the design of the vehicles. And hundred percent. Right. Well, we're I mean, talking about really yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, like, you know, every little thing, every little last detail, you know, the wheels, you know, the accessories, the colors, the interior, the finishes, everything he had his hands in, everything. And let me tell you, there was a lot of back and forth. We fought on certain things, you know, because like a 65 Corvette, which I think turned out fantastic, you know, and there were multiple hands involved in that car. We took some of the stuff apart. You know, the electric inversion was done by Electrified Garage. GCD interiors didn't work on the car, so it was total team effort you know but when we talked about doing that car in the beginning we had talked about putting a modern ls you know and i was already you know like look i'm all for what the customer wants and uh you know i i get that but that was an original drivetrain in that car so for me to pull that out i was like i had trouble with that to begin with and when we had talked about putting a, a modern ls not going electric in that car and then kind of the last minute robert's like you know what? i really want to do electric you know we went back and forth and obviously it's his car and he won out. And I have to say, you know what? As much as I had pushback on it myself personally, the car came out great, you know, and it looks beautiful in there. And it's it's just, it's a fantastic build. I want to talk about some of the early ones. So you, you agree to do the show together. And then I know you had a little bit of a say in which of Robert Downey's cars were selected for modification, but um, there, there are some interesting ones here. Um, his mom's car, he wanted to do something with, right? And yep. and then they were all different. Yeah, the, you mentioned the vet earlier, but a '69 Mercedes, a '72 pickup, an '85 El Camino, '66 Riv, obviously, a '72 VW bus. I mean, yep. this is all over the spectrum, Chris. It, it, you know what? It really is, and I think that's what makes the collection really unique and cool. I mean, there's nothing that's similar in this group of cars here you know other than that finish you know um but they're all different you know and and just they're all cool for different reasons he's an eclectic collector right i, I that's the word i use all the time people ask me well, what kind of collector is i said he's eclectic and he is give me the range I guess it's a lot of what I just said, but beyond that yeah but but you know it goes from Porsches you know to, to other oddball stuff, you know, um, very, very different days. And even like when we were talking about building out some of, you know, this stuff, because some of the cars he wanted us to find for him, you know, like he was really into El Caminos, you know. And a lot of times, like how many Porsche guys are into El Caminos? It's th those, you know, or even Porsche guys are into Vets. Yeah, they, right. those, they, it doesn't match up. And then you go into, you know, a 72K10, you know, it's like some things make sense and others don't. You know, um, you know, for years, 
you know, you wouldn't see guys just in a force cross over to, to a Corvette, you know, it's happened more recently because of the C8. And, you know, and I think the Porsche guys are realizing like, wow, the C8 is a great buy for the money, you know, and it's interesting because now, you know, the 911 and the Corvette are the most cross shop sports cars, which I love to hear that, you know, uh, and like, look, I got to tell you, I love Porsche product. I think they make it, you know, but I'm a, I'm a Corvette guy at heart, you know? So it's like for many years, I have to admit that the, you know, the Corvette couldn't line up with the Porsche, whether it be underpowered or, you know, crappy interior. But now it's like, you know what? They're pretty much on par. You did a VW bus that I know you described as maybe one of the, one of the favorite of six vehicles. Why, why was it important to you? What, what made it special? I've always been a fan of the, the, the buses to begin with. Um, I just li- like them. This this one happens to be Brazilian bus, so it looks like the older ones because um, the German-made buses for '72 did not look like that. Uh, I think what was special for us, you know, and it was it was kind of a battle in the beginning. Like when we went out to go buy that car, it would there were signs that it was going to be a difficult build because a lot of it was rusted, you know. And then we actually had the thing blasted. I mean, I swear to you, every single panel was rotted. So every single panel on that bus. And frame rails were rotted, and we had to change them all. You know, so the guys, you know, really busted their butts to get the thing done. And again, like, it's one thing if you, not that we ever work at a leisurely pace, but it's one thing if you had have a lot of time to do these, but we didn't have time, you know. And then when you throw in the, you know, the supply chain issues and sitting away for parts, it was just, it was stressful. But the guys, you know, they got it done and they turned out really, really nice, you know. And actually, it was the vehicle we used for the last episode. And uh, a bunch of us got together and drove down to the beach and we barbecued down there. And it just, it's one of the things that makes those vehicles cool that you could, well, how many cars can you put seven buddies in and go out with, you know? And like, we were gigging like a little bunch of school guys, like driving down to the, the beach in that thing. It was, just, it was a ball. Had a great time. Let's talk a little bit about him being interested in electric vehicle modification. How and why has that happened? Well, he really cares about the environment, you know, uh, and this is his way of saying, hey, you could still have an old, cool car that is more eco-friendly. And he's right about that. And beyond the, I mean, the, the eco-friendly aspect of it is just one part, but I know there's a, it's almost a greater, a greater good here, isn't there, Chris? Listen, he, he walks to walk and talks to talk, you know, he, he really believes in this. Yeah. Yeah. No, he, he, you can definitely tell. Let's talk about the sweepstakes. How does the sweepstakes work for the cars? You uh, go to rdjdreamcars.com. And you can you make a donation and you're entered to win. You know, well now it's one of the four cars because we, we announced the winner of the K10 pickup the other day here at the show, which was very cool. Great guy out of California that won the car. Uh, and the entry deadline has ended for the El Camino, but the Riv, the Mercedes, the bus, and the Corvette are still in play. And I got to tell you, like the, these cars, to build one of these cars today, you're looking at two two hundred fifty thousand to build one. You know, it's just, it's, I talked to a lot of shops across the country and everybody says the same thing. Can't find good help. You know, everything's expensive. The rents, you know, so like a lot of these shops now, the better shops are charging two, two twenty five, two fifty an hour to do this type of work, you know, so to, to get a car like this, you're looking at a, a big number, you know, so, you know, you make a donation for a good cause and you're entered to win. And I have to tell you, when I did the last week, the lost Corvettes, Every time I called a winner and there were 36 of them, you know, everybody says the same thing. I'm shocked. I never won anything in my life. Well, you can't win unless you enter. You know, and how many people can say they won one of Robert Downey Jr.'s cars and now you can even add Oscar winner next to that. Yeah, exactly. As of recently. Yeah. And to have one of his cars sitting in your driveway. I mean, that's the magic of this whole thing, isn't it? It, it, it really is. Yeah, And they're really special cars and, and We've continued work, you know, with other shops and ourselves of really ma- fine tuning these cars and making them, you know, totally 100% road worthy and, and, you know, something you can drive for a long distance. Let's talk about those modifications. Um, and you referenced it just a, a bit ago, Chris. 
the difficulties of swapping out an LS1 high performance engine for an electric motor or really any of the other conversions that you've made. Share some of those intricacies if if you could and and the real challenges that you must run into. Well, a lot of the stuff that was being done wasn't done before, you know, because look, we started building these cars three and a half years ago, right? So this hobby, they're like if you looked at SEMA the past few years, it's becoming more and more popular to have electric motors, but it wasn't being done a lot back then. So a lot of the stuff you're learning on the fly, what doesn't fit, you're modifying, you cut, you know, you're cutting this, you're cutting that. You know, even like there was a time the, the motor that is in this car, the Riviera I'm in, is out of a 2012 uh, Chevy Tahoe hybrid, you know, and we actually wanted to use the hybrid motor, you know, but, but it sits in the transmission, right? So we started looking at it. We were like, you know what? I don't know if this transmission is going to fit in this car, you know, because it's literally twice the size of the original transmission tunnel, you know? So we started kind of mapping it out. We're like, you know what? We'd have to cut the seats and alter them and, and make the transmission tunnel huge. And it just, it would have taken away from the look of the aesthetics of the interior of this car. So it just didn't make sense. So, you know, we scrapped that. It just didn't work, you know? And there's a lot of trial and error, to, you know, the, the bat, like when we were doing the bus, where the ba- where do we put the batteries? Do they fit here? Do they fit? Does this make sense? Does that make sense? And then even on the bus, we did a, a cut custom electric grill that's powered by solar panels on the roof of that vehicle you know getting that thing to kind of work and fit the right way and slide out you know and, and be kind of as trick and as neat as we want it to that took out you know and it's like and all these hours add up you know it's and, and the other thing too is when you're doing these old cars don't forget again 50 60 70 they don't come apart easy you know a lot of stuff is rusted busted you know rotted you know, so it's just, it's, you know, the, the frame issues with some of the stuff we had to re- replace frame, frame rails. Like I said, the bus, I, I, I can't even tell you the amount of hours went into that thing, you know, <laughs> crazy, you know, and guys, yeah. and, 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 you know, and to the guys credit in the shop, you know, they would stay late and work overtime because they wanted Robert to be happy. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It, are there certain brands that are easier to do this to? You know what? It's it, uh, uh, to be honest with you, I, I think like the VW, there are companies like EV West that make motors that fit in those things. So I think it, it's interesting. I had a conversation with somebody here earlier at the car show that's got a '70 Roadrunner, and he wants to put an electric motor in it. And he was saying that there's there are no companies that are retrofitting and making motors for those t- types of cars yet. And he was asking me, "Do I think it's going to happen?" And I said, "Yeah, as long as there's a need, you know, a, a want and a need for it, somebody will build it. It'll it'll come." And it will, you know, I mean, do I think everything's going to be electric in 10 years from now, 20 years from now, I'm talking about newer stuff. Personally, no, I don't, I don't, I, I think there'll be other, I, I think the modern internal combustion engine is going to be around for a while. It's not going anywhere. I think there'll be hydrogen in the future. I think the stuff we're not even thinking about that we'll see 10, 15 years down the road. Cause you think about how quickly technology changes now, you know, it's amazing. So I'm sure there's stuff that we're not even thinking about that cars will be powered by. Well, you make a good point because there are 300 million vehicles that are on the road right now. We're going to be doing this. You're going to be doing auto restoration for a long time, right? Yeah. We're not going anywhere. <laughs> and and I believe that at, as the electric car movement picks up speed, if you will... Um, that there will be others who say, you know what, I want to, I want to keep what I have in my garage, and we're just going to restore it going forward. Would you agree with that? I agree, one hundred percent. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you're in a new place now. You've you've just moved into a new location on Long Island. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, we were, the original location was in Hicksville. Now we're in Plainview. Um, great location. We're right off the Long Island Expressway, and we're in a complex where Ferrari and Lucid Motors are our neighbors. Uh, so we're in good company over there. It's a great spot, state of the art facility. Everything's brand new. We built it all out um, scratch. So that's appropriate. So you've got Lucid in your neighborhood, and you've got Ferrari, yeah. and you're doing. <laughs> I know, <operation>. right? <laughs> what can you do out of there? How? How? What sort of volume are you doing? You know, we do everything from soup to nuts. You know, it, it, it's not a huge shop. You know, we try to keep it like, you know, four or five cars in, in the shop at, at once. We do everything. You know, we do body work, mechanical work, and paint. 
So we really, uh, and we do fabrication as well. We talked to Victoria Bruno as one of our guests. She's a, a very young Ferrari um, restoration mechanic, if you will, with a specialty. And it struck us as I was having the conversation with her that there aren't enough Victoria Brunos out there. And I don't just mean gender, I mean age. Getting folks who are younger into the into the um, uh, the side of uh, mechanical uh, work and car restoration, that's got to turn at some point, doesn't it, Chris? You know what? It really should because you think about what we hear in the news constantly that college educated kids can't get a job, right? So these trades, like we have apprentices that make thirty, forty dollars an hour in the shop, you know. That's significant money for a kid that's 18 years old. And we have we have a couple of young kids that are 18, 19, 20 that work with us. And they're great. You know, they took these shop classes, you know, you know, or, or uh, technical classes and became mechanics in, in school. And they come and work in a shop like this. And, that, you know, it's like and I tell these guys, I want you to be with us. You know, as long as you want to be with us, you can retire with us because it's really hard to find people that do that, especially younger people, which kind of. You know, I think I talked about this the other day with some friends about these auto shows and how important they are uh, for the manufacturer to be here to to get little kids interested in these cars. You know, because I know for myself, you know, I've been coming to these shows for years. I, you know, as a young kid, I would see these Corvettes and I was like, man, I'm going to have one of those one these days. I'm going I'm to have that car. And that love affair started 40, 50 years ago at these shows. You know, so it's important that we get the younger generation, you know, into the cars and actually into the hobby and as a job. Yeah. Having just been to the New York show and seeing um, that there are more manufacturers, if not just because of the dealer community that brought some of their, their own brands. in, even when the, when right. the manufacturers didn't support it, it's still, That's right. you've, you've got the whole collection of the automotive world, which is what it should be. I did the same thing as you did. I went to shows when I was a kid too. So did, so did my kid, you know? Yeah. It's, 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 you know, it's, it really is a great hobby. I mean, I love going to car shows, you know, and I'm even talking about like, you know, the older school, not like I love these as well. You know, I was in the, uh, the LA shows at Chicago, all wonderful shows, you know, but going to those shows with the older cars, it's just, there's something special and the people there and then the stories you hear and who found this and uh, this car's an original owner. It's, just, you know, these cars are like, they're rolling art. They're works of art, you know, yeah. and they're a piece of history. You know, especially this country. We, th when we go back to it, you were actually going to be an attorney, right? Yeah. So, yeah, my high school, I went to Northport High School in Long Island. Uh, go Tigers, by the way. And <laughs> um, we had, uh, believe it or not, when I was in high school, we had law a law program where you could study constitutional law, trial law. We had like a mock uh, courtroom set up where we would do trials. Uh, I took a, a field trip and we went to England for a couple of weeks and studied with the barristers there. So I was really, I really wanted to be an attorney. And um, I was talking to a couple of colleges about going there on a soccer scholarship. Then I blew my knees out and did my soccer career. Um, so I kind of changed directions and went, I went up on an FIT and studied menswear design. Well, you blew out two knees, didn't you? I did. I yeah. did. And this you is before that arthroscopic surgery. So. Right, right, exactly. So a much you, bigger deal. You're at FIT. You're intrigued by design, but it wasn't really for you. And then, uh, then you decided that you were going to again get into the get into the club business. But it's that eye for design. Let's not lose that moment, Chris. You had yeah, the eye. you know, I want, I've always loved design. There was a second there I thought of going to GMI, you know, uh, and learning car. And, and, and like, look, if, 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 I don't have a lot of regrets in life, and I, and I kind of. I think every thing I've done in my life has brought me to where I am today, and I, I like where I am today. Um, but I sometimes think, ah, what would it have been like if I went to GMI? You know, because I just, you know, I really, I love cars. Yeah, and so does Robert Downey Jr. And I want to emphasize um, on this program the fact that he is serious about what he's doing here. I mean, there are some, as you know, especially in you know Hollywood circles, who sort of dabble in various endeavors because. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe it looks good. Maybe they might have a passing interest. Um, maybe there's a charitable thing attached to it. But this is right down to, I mean, not only does he want to make the world a better planet, but he also really loves what he's doing with you. 100%. Total labor love, you know, and it wasn't like, 
anytime we needed him or you know to weigh in on something, he was always reachable. Which like, look, this guy's busy. He's got a huge career going on. Look what's going on right now with the movies that come out, TV shows, a book, a coffee line. God bless him. I mean, this guy's all over the place. But you know, whenever we needed him, he was there. You know, and you know the, the days that we needed him for filming. I mean, he was just a total pro on set, just awesome. And he he is very very committed to this. This is not you know a fleeting thing for him. Will there be another season of the show? You know what? Last time I was in LA, Robert and I talked about it. You know, I, I it, it really depends on his schedule. He, he, I think he would like to do one. I think we all would. You know, because we all kind of believe in in the cause and what we're doing here. So we'll keep our fingers crossed. Meantime, when you when folks go to the New York Auto Show, what will they see? Uh, paint us a picture, if you will. Sure, sure. We're in booth 1601 on the lower level. Um, the six Downey cars are here. Uh, 66 Riviera, 85 El Camino, 72 VW bus, 72 pickup truck, 65 Corvette, um, and the 69 Mercedes 280 SE. So they'll be able to see and touch and feel and everything else that 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 you've got going. And and if if I wanted to have my car restored on your new shop out in Long Island, what's the process behind that, Chris? You uh, you reach out to us and we bring the car in, take a look at it, talk about what you want to do, and like literally, we would sit down in a conference room with me and a team of guys, uh, you know, and talk about what you want to do, and then you know, map it out. And are you full? How fully committed are you right now? I mean, if I, what what's the timeline on a typical restoration? Like a full restoration, you know, it, it takes a couple of years, you know, um, and we got a little bit of a waiting list. Mechanical stuff's easier because we could turn that stuff over quickly, you know, and, and like basic repairs. But like the long term stuff, it's you know, it, it takes a bit of time to get in. And for those who are novices in the restoration business, what does someone need to be considering and thinking about when they're going to take on that kind of project? Well, it takes a lot of time and a lot of money, you know, and I think a lot of people lose sight of the fact, like there are no shortcuts with this stuff, you know, and if you think you're getting a great deal and you're paying way under what the market is, somebody's cutting quarters somewhere. You know, and it's a shame because like a lot of times we get cars into the shop and we're actually repairing other shops work. And, it, it, you know, it's just they the other shop cut corners. They didn't do things the right way. You know, there are no shortcuts in life and you, you get what you pay for. Right. Yeah. I, are there um, did, did did COVID change the way that car collectors look at their vehicles? I mean, we've we've been out to Pebble. We've. We've gone to the you know the bottom shows. We you know we've done things like that, and it seems to me that there's especially post COVID, there's been a real appetite for auctions and restoration, and um, maybe a bit of a rejuvenation of the American car world. Yeah, I, I think you make a good point. I think what COVID showed people is, hey, you know, life is short, and you don't know when your time is up. You know, so if you're sitting on the sidelines and you're waiting to get into the like, I have a couple of friends that are well off. And they're like, oh, I'm thinking about getting. I'm like, look, stop thinking about it. You know, you're worth millions of dollars. It's a thirty thousand dollar car, forty thousand dollar car. If you really want it, then pull the trigger because you don't know how long you're going to be here for. You know, so it's like I think people now start to realize like my time here is limited. You know, and maybe I should do something. You know, and, and I think I think a lot of people have got into the market during COVID. I actually expected the business to be worse than what it you know, but it, we saw an increase. Yeah, fascinating. Uh, a standout car from your childhood. We just we'll just revert this conversation right back to the beginning of. Um, um, maybe, yeah, maybe. I mean, listen, my dream car has been the same for many many years, and I talk about it all con all the time. It's a '69 Corvette ZL1. They made two or three of them, depending on who you ask. A guy named Roger Judsky owns it down in Florida right now. He bought it from the U.S. government in 1980 at a drug auction. You know, they seized it from a drug dealer. And, uh, you know, the car's worth, depending on you, three, four million bucks. It's a, you know, super rare car. It's an all aluminum block pushing 550 horsepower. They said it was 430 from the factory. Uh, but the one that this guy owns, it's yellow with black stripes and black interior. So that is, that is my dream car. 
not the 64 Impala SS that your dad drove you home from the hospital. <laughs> that's, an, that's a different, that's a different type of dream, but I like that car too. <laughs> <laughs> you restored that, right? Actually, no, we, we bought that car done. Uh, we, we did another one together, uh, a 58. My dad, had, similar to what he had as a kid, we found one in the 80s and restored that car together. You've, a, you've got a pretty good story around that, though. Just share that for us here to close out. So my dad was a big Impala guy. You know, we had a, a couple of 58s, and then he had a 64, which he drove me home from the hospital in. Uh, we restored a 58 Impala together. Uh, in the nineties and then he had to sell the car. And I remember what, you know, I was like thinking to myself someday when I have money, I'm going to buy my father under one of these cars. So when things started to go well for me in my life, the first thing I, I wanted to do is find my dad, either a 58 or a 64 Impala SS. Um, 58 are harder to find. I found a really nice 64 Impala SS down in Texas. Um, this guy was a great guy that sold me the car. I, I, I bought the car. I had it shipped up to New York, uh, parked it in front of my building and invited my dad into the city for lunch. And I was waiting in my lobby and he walks in and the car's parked in front of the building and he walks in and he goes, did you see that car outside? I said, yeah. He goes, that's just like the car I drove you home from the hospital. And that, that's the car I had. I said, dad, that is your car. No, I, gave no. for, I gave it to him for Father's Day 20 years ago. What a great, great little story. What a great story, yeah. Chris. Yep. What yep. a great story. What a great story that you have. And um, if folks want more information on what you and Robert Downey Jr. are doing, again, the website for us. RDJDreamCars.com. Yeah, wonderful. And if you're at the New York Auto Show, you could stop by and you can see Come see, see me, yeah. He'll, he won't be sitting in the car forever, uh, certainly during the, the couple weeks of the show, but he is sitting there now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we are deeply appreciative. It's great to have you on the program. This is Cars and Culture. You are Cars You are cars and Culture. You're certainly restoring it, bringing it to life, and creating car culture. So, Chris, thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks, buddy. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank Jason. you.